No, I had to acknowledge that it's being that it's being recorded. So I am going to go ahead and get us started. Good evening to everyone. My name is Antoinette Green Tubbs, and I am a member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, Alpha Sigma Omega Chapter here in Columbus, Ohio. It is my sincere pleasure to mm -hmm. welcome you to the table on this beautiful fall evening for our Green Table Talk, which is a dialogue about making money moves. This program is a part of our initiative on building an economic legacy. I'd like to thank and welcome all members of Alpha Kappa Alpha and everyone zooming in with us for this intimate conversation. And I would especially like to welcome our president of Alpha Sigma Omega Chapter, Ms. Valerie M. Tarver, all past presidents, our current vice president, Mrs. Tracy Bell Thomas, and our second vice president, Ms. Monica Scott, who I believe will be joining us. So at this time, I will have our president, Ms. Valerie Tarver, um, greet us with a welcome. Well, welcome. It's so exciting to have you here. Back in April, when we spoke with um, Ms. Thornton about the possibility of educating our women here in Columbus, because she had such a dynamic following and wanting us to think through what are those crucial money moves we need to be making um, in light of being in COVID and just to put us in a better position. Um, I was very excited that she was able to agree to come and talk to us today. So I don't want to take any moment away from you all because I am excited, as I said last night, to learn about those money moves. So with that, I will hand it back to you, Miss, Miss Green Tubbs, and take us to the next step. Thank you, Ms. Tarver, for that welcome. Uh, before we move on uh, with our agenda this evening, I want to just give us a few housekeeping tips. Um, please feel free to post your money-related questions in the chat, and our speaker is excited to um, answer those during tonight's presentation. Um, but before we introduce her, I do want to um, introduce one of our uh, committee members, Ms. Savanya Barnes. Um, we truly believe as we were in our planning process that there is a, a power associated with storytelling and sharing our stories. And I believe as women, a lot of times um, we sell ourselves short because we keep everything close to the vest and we don't share and we don't allow ourselves to be vulnerable. And so um, Miss Savanya is going to just give us her, I'm going to call it a Tuesday testimony as it relates to some money moves that um, she has recently made. She's going to share her story with us and hopefully it will encourage you um, if you feel comfortable sharing this evening, if not, that's okay. Um, but this is an intimate conversation, it's a dialogue. So uh, please help me welcome Ms. Savanya Barnes. Good evening, everyone. And thank you so much for attending tonight. So I don't know how everyone else's 2020 um, went, but I would like to share with you how mine at least got started. So on February the 4th, 2020, I posted on Facebook, long post alert. I've shared this with a few people in my inner circle. Today, I'm sharing it with Facebook. First of all, I had to get myself together before sharing this. In a very small group setting, during the first week of the new year, there was a discussion about resolutions. Um, I was a third person to share, and they had the audacity to ask me if I needed more time to think about it. Now, Savannah's always thinking, I may not be sharing, but I'm always thinking. I told them, my first resolution is to pick out my clothes the night before. My second resolution is to pack my lunch the night before. And my third resolution is to save $25,000 by the end of the year. They laughed instantly, almost falling out of their chairs and said, girl, it's always good to have a dream. I smiled. I gave them the head nod because clearly they didn't know me. I'm sure they laughed because I was a contractor at the time and didn't have a permanent role, but I'm a saver no matter what my job title may be. I took it as a challenge. I moved over a little money into a brokerage account and began scouring for solid mutual funds and stocks. When the market dropped the first week 
when the market dropped that week, I said, okay, no going out to eat for a few weeks, but I can't let this opportunity pass me by. And I moved over some more money. Even with that roller coaster market at the time, I was up three and a half percent, which wasn't a lot, but it's more than I would have had had I let my money sit in the bank. I may not reach, I said I would I may not reach the 25,000 by the end of the year, but whatever I had at the end of the year, it will be a multiplicity of what I started with on January the 1st, 2020. I said all that to say, who isn't with you matters not. What matters is your belief in God, your belief in yourself, and a quality, an equality group of people who can't wait to cheer you on to victory. So two months after writing that post, like many others, I was laid off about a week. I was laid off, but about a week before that job ended, one of the young ladies who laughed at me asked me, how long have you been investing? I said, I've been investing since I was eight, when I used to give my dad my bubblegum proceeds so that he could invest into the local power provider. By the end of March 2020, two friends had joined me in the journey. And by the end of that year, 10 of us were strategizing about what to buy and at what price. I used every CARES Act break that I could get. State and federal tax refunds invested. Stimulus checks invested. Gas money that I wasn't using because I wasn't going anywhere anyway invested. I beg you to remember one thing. When opportunity knocks, don't just open the door. Take the door off the hinges. With mustard seed faith, encouragement from my parents, friends, and family, on December the 31st of 2020, my friends and I raised our virtual glasses and I had $26,199 in my bank account. I'm sorry, in my brokerage account. Thank you. Wow. Let's just come off mute and just give some applause and oh some God. love to Miss <laughs> Barnes. That is such a that is awesome. phenomenal. Wow. That powerful is amazing. Amazing. Testament to amazing. I need her stat tips too. So <laughs> what dedication can do. I'm getting all steamy in my eyes a little bit. Me too. Because I know how hard you've worked. And I just want to publicly commend you um, for that. That is such a powerful testimony to what dedication can do. And congratulations for not only reaching but exceeding your goal, if I heard you correctly. Yeah. Um, so congratulations, and we look forward to um, hearing more from you on that. So, and there's all kinds of comments coming to you in the chat about congratulations, what a blessing, awesome testimony, awesome story. So, thank you for sharing and encouraging us with that. It's so easy to keep that type of stuff to yourself, you know? Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. So, thank you so much for sharing that. Absolutely. So um, without any further ado, and we'll do some more of that, we'll, we'll see what happens. I want to introduce um, our esteemed speaker and presenter, who is also a member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, my sister, uh, Miss Janai Thornton. I, can, I, I can't even begin to um, read her bio. It would take us the whole hour of our program to let you guys know everything, um, that she does. But let me tell you, um, this sister is bad. She is, um, on our nationally syndicated radio shows. If you've ever listened to the Ricky Smiley morning show or the Willie Moore Jr. show, which is where I first became acquainted with her listening to that show, um, on my way home from work on Mondays and he was like talking to her and she was giving all these money tips on Mondays. And I was like, who is she? I'm about to find her. And I kind of started to stalk her on Instagram and just <laughs> followed her. And it has just been such a blessing, uh, such a blessing to me. And so I am highly honored that she has taken time out of her um, extremely um, busy schedule as a certified public accountant. And she's an accountant to the stars, to the celebrities. And I'll let her uh, tell you more about that if she chooses. But um, without any further ado, I want to welcome uh, my friend and my sister, Janai Thornton. Hi, good evening, everybody. Welcome. Um, 
Thank you, thank you, thank you. I am so excited to be here. I'm gonna go ahead on and share my screen. Wanna make sure you all can see it. Can y'all see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. So thank you so much um, for the invitation. And it's funny, um, Antoinette, who I can affectionately call one of my BFFs, she literally did stalk me on Instagram. And so she was DMing me. And of course, um, you know, I love when sores reach out to me because I always get the little pink and green hearts, um, you know, when they're talking to me. But of all the people that I love to talk to the most, I love talking to Black women, first and foremost. And absolutely, any chance that I can get, I love to speak to sores. Um, I live in Atlanta. Uh, I'm an active member of NLO, New Lambda Omega. And um, again, just super excited to be here with all of you. Uh, I did want to take a minute and just really say thank you to your chapter leadership. Um, Soars, Valerie Tarver, Tracy Bell Thomas, and Monica Scott. Um, it does mean a lot because I know that we do have a target and I know that we're supposed to be focused on money and that we're supposed to talk about it. But candidly, I think a lot of us as chapters really don't know how to approach it. Um, I think a lot of us really struggle and I think we spend so much time focused on it externally to the community that we're really not focused on it internally for us. Um, you know, one thing that I have learned um, as much as I talk about money and educate people about money, those of us who are Black, female, professional, educated, we're the ones who hide the most when it comes to money. We are the biggest hiders because a lot of times I think we think people already know who we are, you know, what we should know, how we should be showing up financially. And, and that's just not true for us culturally, although a lot of us are doing better professionally, making more money, more educated than we've ever been before. But we certainly are not where we need to be um, financially. We just don't have the tools. Um, I like to refer to us as chief money officers. Most of us are. But guess what? No one trained us for this job. You know, we inherited the job, um, didn't sign up for the job, but absolutely we have the job. So Antoinette talked about my work in media. So um, I do a couple of things. Um, I do, I own my own company. I've been an entrepreneur for 25 years. I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about that, but I am, I'm a CPA by trade and I work exclusively in the entertainment industry. So my company Envision Business Management Group, we manage the monies of primarily artists, talent. So have you ever been to a concert um, before COVID, my company would be helping facilitate almost 500 concerts a year. We're the ones hiring all the people, paying all the people, collecting all of the money, doing all the budgets and helping people move logistically city to city, state to state and country to country. But because of COVID, guess what? We went from 500 concerts a year in 2020. I think we had about 10. So I understand the impact of COVID. You know, we were significantly impacted. So I have some pictures up here of the radio um, work that I do. So I do work with Reach Media. Um, what's really cool about Reach Media, whether you're listening to Erica Campbell, Ricky Smiley, Morning Hustle, Willie Moore Jr., all of those shows are owned by one company, um, which is Reach Media. So that's the reason why I'm able to do so many of them. And um, so please continue to listen. We really appreciate it. Please engage with us. But you know, what's interesting about my bio, you know, what it doesn't show you or tell you is that um, I had my first child after my junior year of college, in college. I went to North Carolina A&T undergrad. I had my first child at 21. I had my um, second child at 25. I started a business, um, left corporate America, thought I was cute, thought I was ready, jumped out there, and guess what? Was not ready at all. I have struggled financially. I have been, you, you say the spectrum, I've been that 21 year old with nothing. I mean, we weren't broke, we were super broke. 
So I know what that feels like. So I don't want anybody to think that I've always had it all right, that I've always had all the answers. It has really been a process. I'm super grateful that I just grew up in a family that was full of entrepreneurs. So I knew how to get on my feet, you know, understood how to make money because that was normal. That was around me. But um, I completely understand. And then when Antoinette was talking about we were going to do a green table talk, you know, forget the red table. We're going to do the green table. I'm like, you know, I thought that was a really good idea because we have to share more information. We have to talk more about money and feel comfortable sharing. So we're going to do some sharing certainly today. Um, another thing that I wanted to make sure everybody knew about, no matter where you live, is um, about the community that I launched earlier this year. So it's called Thank Me Later. Um, it's a free community. Um, it's for women only. Um, and in this community, we make sure that you understand what you need to be focused on every single month. So you know you're supposed to pay your bills, you know you're supposed to keep up with your budget, you know you're supposed to be checking your balances, but with all the other financial things that need to be done, how do you know what to do and when to do it? So at Thank Me Later, we have taken the guesswork out of that. So please engage with us. You can go to thankmelater.money. Um, we will send you an invitation. And that way you can keep up with what we're focused on. So for example, it's October. Our focus for the month of October is insurance. So we're going to be covering life insurance. We're going to be doing all things PNC, property and casualty, homeowners, renters, car insurance, umbrella insurance, personal articles insurance. And back tomorrow, if you follow me on Instagram, tomorrow at 7 p.m., we're going to be with another SOAR, um, Carol Jones, who owns a state farm agency in Metro Atlanta. She's been the, in the insurance business over 30 years. She's going to teach us on Instagram Live tomorrow at 7 p.m. how to do a home inventory. So I know a lot of us, we have homeowners insurance and we have renters insurance you know, you've got that section that's called personal articles, like, oh, you know, something happens. I have $100,000 in coverage. You know, that's to replace our furniture and clothing and dishes and sheets and towels. But those people are not going to write you a check for $100,000. It doesn't work that way. You have to prove what you own. So anyway, that's what we're going to be doing tomorrow. But again, please engage with us. The program is really, really good. Um, August, we did... Um, financial aid and scholarships. Again, um, I'm sorry, August, we did um, legal documents, wills, power of attorneys. Um, September, we did financial aid and scholarships. October, again, all things insurance. November, we're going to go into open enrollment, all things personal benefits. So again, every single month, we have a different theme. So again, please engage with us. All right, so please stay connected to me. So um, here is my personal email address. And again, how you can interact with me on social media. Um, if you don't feel comfortable engaging today and sharing any information or questions, please don't hesitate to email me directly. I'd love to talk to you and love to engage with you. So when Antoinette and I talked, I was like, listen, hey, can we get um, some folks, some SOARs to go ahead on and submit some questions in advance? Because I did have some things that I wanted to talk about. So I do have your questions. So I want to go through those and um, I'm going to answer a few of the questions that you all submitted. Then we're going to kind of go over some of the things. Um, we're going to open up this pink table a little bit and then I'm going to go back to some of the questions. But please feel free to go ahead and drop anything in the chat that you wanna share. Definitely wanna be able to hear from you. You don't have to wait to the end to the presentation to submit your question. So we're gonna take questions midpoint and then again at the end. All right, let's talk about some of the money questions that you ladies submitted. I loved the variety of questions that you all sent. Um, I can tell what's on the top of people's minds for sure. So, um, and there was a lot of questions about investing and I'm certainly happy that you all are um, really focused on that. So um, here are some of the questions. One was what are reliable places or sources for investment training and education? 
And um, you want to be very careful about this because some of these classes, you know, when I was doing some research preparing for this, I cannot believe how much some of these classes cost. Um, please do not spend an $2,000, $4,000. Do not do that because you don't need to. I promise you, you don't need to. So this link that I just shared is um, some of the best investment courses. The number one course I don't even think was $30. You need to be coming in like $100 or less initially. So if you click on this link, the Investopedia Best Investment Courses, it's going to list like part of the top 10. So again, I'll share these slides. Please feel free to take a picture of this. But here's a way for you to kind of get your feet wet. Because remember, that's all you want to do is you want to get your feet wet. You're not trying to dive in. You're not trying to do, get a degree in this. You know, you're not trying to get your Series 7 license. You just want to kind of really get familiar and comfortable. So um, are any of you familiar with Skillshare? Anybody familiar with the site Skillshare? Um, anybody who wants to learn anything, whether it's investment related cooking related, please check out the website Skillshare. They have hundreds of courses, hundreds and hundreds of courses. So I think that's going to be another source for you as well. So I want to share some sources with you. When I'm doing research, when I'm preparing for radio, I want to tell you where I go when I'm fact checking, preparing my content for Willie Moore Jr. or Ricky Smiley. Um, one of my favorites is I love Kiplinger, love Kiplinger. I love Clark Howard. Not sure if y'all have him there in Ohio. He is very popular. He's a national, nationally syndicated financial guru radio host, really, really big in Georgia. I'll go to Clark Howard's site. I love, 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 love Nerd Wallet. Oh my gosh. They have amazing content. They have easy, digestible, whether you want to learn things about investments or insurance, Nerd Wallet is amazing. Um, bank rates in almost any major media outlet, like a CNBC, US News, if you go to their websites, they all have money sections. Because I want you to get trained and get used to going to a real authentic, reliable source. You should not just be going into Google, dropping in what you're looking for. Who has time to be reading, you know, the 2000 things that come up, but who are reliable sources? Everyone here that I named, um, absolutely reliable sources. And you can feel confident that you're getting impartial information. Because that's the thing about, you know, not just about financial information. You just want to make sure people aren't really just trying to sell you something. You know, they're trying to push a particular agenda. But I do. Um, Kiplinger, Clark Howard, Nerd Wallet, Bank Rate. Um, those are some really good sources. Now, at the end of the presentation, I'm going to talk to you about the importance of regularly scheduled money meetings. And research is something that you can do during your money meetings time. Because you want to get in the habit, not just kind of sporadically, but, you know, hey, I'm really trying to do a deeper dive on car insurance or how much I need to be spending on life insurance. Um, these are the sources that you certainly want to use. So again, if you have any questions, um, please, please let me know. Or if you have any other suggestions, someplace that you really rely upon, please definitely share that in the chat as well. Now, someone asked, someone else asked about top investment apps. So, you know, one thing that I can say that I'm certainly really excited about how, you know, back in the day, and I know a lot of us are old enough to remember, like you had to have an investment advisor. If you were going to get into the market, like you had to hire somebody to help you. Now with technology, that barrier has really been removed now. Um, literally with your phone, that's all you need now. You can download some of these apps. Acorn, Betterment, Robinhood, Stockpile, um, even if you like some of the major firms like a Charles Schwab, all of them are competing now where you can get into the market um, with significantly less money. 
you're paying less fees. Um, you can buy fractional shares. You don't have enough money to buy a whole share of Apple stock. Now you can buy a quarter of a share. They're doing all this to be able to track all of us everyday regular people now and for younger people too. Um, so this is really important. So if you're not investing at all, um, you're kind of nervous about investing, this is a really good way to start is by using one of these apps to really get in the game um, and get your feet wet and get comfortable with it. So again, I highly suggest it. Which one that you use, honestly, it doesn't matter to me. You can read the reviews. I want you to use whatever you're actually going to use, You know, whatever you feel comfortable with. But again, now um, they've taken a lot of the challenges that we, a lot of us culturally had who, who do we feel comfortable um, giving our money to? How much are they going to charge us? They have all that transparency now and they make it so easy for us. Um, one of the suggestions that I'm going to make in the context of investing is you want to um, invest regularly. And so um, what that looks like, there's a term, it's called dollar cost averaging. So that means regardless of what's going on in the market, it's going up, it's going down. Uh, we, I know we got a lot of craziness going on right now with the economy that regardless with dollar cost averaging, every month, every week, every time you get paid, you are putting some money in the market. And it's just a habit. So I don't care if it's $25 doesn't have to be $2,000. You start wherever you can start, but you have to consistently do that. Because remember, it's called investing. It's not called gambling. You know, you're not in Vegas pushing your chips all, all in the middle of the table. You want to slowly get in. You want to get comfortable, but you want to make sure that you're regularly contributing to the market. That's really important. Now, someone asked, else asked about this cryptocurrency. I'm like, this cryptocurrency is the rave right now. What the heck does it mean? Bitcoin, all of these other terms. Um, so bottom line, cryptocurrency is simply a digital currency now. That's all it is. So instead of a paper currency, now it's a digital currency that you can actually use. You can use it to buy. Um, and sell goods or services. It's interesting to me the number of companies now that are accepting cryptocurrency payments. Like it, they are really pushing the agenda for this to become a regular um, medium, a regular way of paying for goods or services. Now, the thing about it is, you know, um, should you invest in it? And it, I'm not anti cryptocurrency, I consider it an alternative investment. And so alternatives is a cryptocurrency. Maybe you wanna invest in gold. Maybe you wanna invest in silver. Those to me are considered alternatives. And I don't see anything wrong with it. So say for example, if you have $1,000 to invest, maybe you'll start five or 10% with an alternative. So instead of saying, I'm gonna put the whole $1,000 into um, into Bitcoin or into any one of the other cryptocurrencies, instead of putting the whole thousand dollars in, again, maybe you start with 10% of that, five or 10% of that, and begin to ease your way into it because you have to educate yourself. You got to educate yourself. I think um, when Sora Sabonia was talking about how they were having meetings and they were talking about what to buy, that's the effort. Just like we can talk about where we want to shop, you know, who's having a sale where, we can just as easily come together and be talking about what investments that we should be making. So you want to make an educated investment. Again, this is not gambling. This is not just following what they're talking about on social media. You've got to do your own research. And it doesn't have to be a full-time job for you. But again, I just want you to know it absolutely positively takes some effort, though. You cannot be on the sideline and end up being where you want to be. You know, the other thing, too, that I appreciated about what Savonia shared was, like, she had a very specific goal. And I think that's important in investing instead of just saying, oh, you know, I'm going to start investing. 
Are you investing for your retirement? Is it your children's education? Is it for your new house that you want? Is it for your vacation? Is it to just get to a certain dollar amount? Like know what you want and why. That's super important. You want to do that. Um, this was another good question. Someone asked about rave. Uh, what does the rave about meme stocks? Meme stocks. And so meme stocks is simply a stock that has gone viral on social media. That's all that means. And we know that stuff that goes viral on social media or on the internet, it may not mean that it's legit. So just because you hear um, about certain stocks, please don't think you're just supposed to jump on the bandwagon. You've got to do your own due diligence and research. Um, you know, you have to understand, you know, with social media, the influence that it has on our financial decisions, the things that we're doing. They're trying to get us to act a certain way. So just because y'all heard about all that craziness with Robin Hood um, and um, I forgot what particular stock that everybody was busting their butt to buy, just because they say it. Meanwhile, the company value really wasn't that good or it wasn't going up. It was just all this um, social media, virtual um, perception. So we want to make sure that we're really focused, focused on the facts. Okay. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to start talking about um, some of the money topics that women hate to talk about. All right. So I know a lot of y'all like, Janai, do we have to? Yes, we do. So we're not going to do a deep dive, but these are the things. If anything I say right now is going to rub you the wrong way, that means you need to spend some time with this. All right. So I get to talk to a lot of women through radio and hear the top things that women hate to talk about. Ladies, um, financially supporting our adult children. Um, for those of us particularly who are focused on retiring, I'm 52 years old. I have a 27 and a 31 year old son. Retirement is top of mind for me. Um, the number one thing that keeps women, particularly black women from retiring is the amount of support that we're giving to our adult kids. So I'm a mom, I love my kids too, but ladies, we gotta take care of ourselves first. So again, if I'm kind of rubbing you the wrong way, something for sure that you need to um, understand why this is bothering you so much. Financially supporting our relatives. Same thing, parents, nieces, nephews, siblings, um, all of us have those people in our families. Um, we're gonna have to learn how to establish some boundaries because again, you have to remember if you're not doing the math, if you're constantly just helping folks out, not understanding the impact on you, it is going to have some impact on where you want to be. Again, new house, new car, retirement, whatever your goals are. But we got to be careful. So I'm not saying cut everybody off. Understand the commitment and the consequences of the decisions that we're making. Um, the financial impact of divorce. It's another thing that we don't like to talk about. Um, I've seen women have to start all the way over literally all the way over. And I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but we need to share this information with each other because there's tips, you know, there's tricks that we should resources. So we understand what this impact can be. We have to, um, we have to know it. My best friend, another store who is my roommate, roommate at A&T, um, literally had a divorce and had to completely start over. I think it probably took her like about six years to get fully back on her feet. That's not unusual, but that way we can help set expectations, you know, but again, we should not be ashamed to talk about where we are, what we have going on. All right, ladies, this is a big one. Student loans, you know, ladies want to disappear when you start talking about student loans. It could be your own personal student loans, um, or it can be your children's. Um, a very good friend of mine, who's also in my um, chapter, amazing, principal, baddest chick in the game, right? PhD, and I'm like, I know how old I am. I'm like, so I know she's older than I am. I'm like, why haven't you retired? And she said, I can't, because I'm still paying my kids student loans. 
I'm thinking to myself, <laughs> now, the other flip side of the story, which is crazy, neither one of her kids graduated from college. So she got stuck with a parent plus loans, putting her kids through school. Two kids, no degree, and this is what's keeping her from retiring. Okay? We have to understand the commitment. Um, those parent plus loans, please don't do it. I'm asking you, please, please, please find another way. Okay? Because we have to figure out another way to get our babies through school because the cost, four or five years of education, now the next 20 plus years we're paying for it. We all know that that doesn't make any sense. We know that doesn't make any sense, okay? So let's not hide from the student loans. Let's get a plan and a strategy about how we're going to handle them. Another thing we hate to talk about, estate planning. Um, I have a friend, her family owns a, a large funeral home in Atlanta, and she has this joke. She always says, like, Janine, we got some new customers today. Because guess what? Every time somebody new is passing away, nobody, there's no repeat customers with this business. We all have to leave here, you know, whether it's us or the people that we care about. So we need to have some order. This is why, for Black people, why we don't transfer wealth the right way. 80% of Black people who die do not have a will. 80%. This is regardless of education, regardless of income, regardless of assets. 80% of Black people die without a will. We have to have one. Wills are not just for rich people. If you have minor children or you have children with disabilities or someone in your family that you're in charge of, you need a will. You own a house. You own a car. You need a will. So please make sure, particularly y'all know all this craziness with COVID, is really important that you make this a priority. Or maybe you had one and you did it forever ago and it's time to update those documents. You certainly want to do that, okay? But again, this is one of these other topics that we, that we try to avoid. We avoid like the plague, but we have to deal with this. We got to deal with this. Okay, life insurance. A lot of us don't like to talk about this either. Um, do you have enough? Who am I supposed to have life insurance on? Who should have life insurance on me? So the money experts say that you should have five to 10 times your annual income. You make $70,000 a year. Um, they say in a perfect world, you should have at least $700,000 in life insurance. I say you should have what you can afford. Get what you can afford. And I believe in paying for it once a year. It's something about having to pay that bill every month. A little life happens. We get off track. We can't afford for that to happen. That's something that happens to us a lot culturally is we'll get a life insurance policy. We'll pay it good for a couple of years. And then some life happens. And guess what? We stop paying. And then somebody passes away or we pass away. And then that money is gone. So get what you can afford. Um, you know, is it better to have term um, like like renting? Um, it's typically cheaper versus a whole life or permanent. Um, you can have a combination of both. But I want you to get what your budget can afford. Um, I, some people believe in having life insurance on kids. I believe in having life insurance on whoever brings an income into the household. So you and your husband are both working. You, you and your sister live together. You all are both working. You want to be able to replace that income because that's what life insurance is about. It's like, oh my gosh, you know, if my husband passes away, I can replace his income and we can move forward. That's really what it is. That's what it's really designed for. Now, our, our white sisters have figured this out. They, they approach death completely differently than what we do. Estate planning and life insurance, they don't play any games about that. We, we have to be okay about talking about this. Getting the policies in place is really, really important. You know, So again, it's not trying to be able to monetize someone's death. It's about who has to live and what level do we want them to live at if something happens. Okay, so life insurance, 
And then the last topic we try to avoid is retirement. You know, nobody wants to work forever. We want to have a choice, but you can't just be saving towards retirement, okay? Like, what's your magic number? How much do you need? Do you need 3 million? You need 1 million? You need 10 million? You need 500,000? There's a way to figure that out, okay? So don't run from it. And even if you're, Jana, I'm in my 40s, I haven't started. That's okay. You know, Jana, I'm in my 50s. I know I'm not where I'm supposed to be. That's the majority of people. Know the number and now let's put together a strategy to confront this. Because ignoring it is kind of like ignoring that you're pregnant. It's not going to change anything. You know, we're all maturing. We're getting older. And really what we all want is just a choice. We're looking for options. Nothing wrong with working as long as you want to work. Not that you have to work. You want to put yourself in a position where you have that choice. Okay, so before I answer any more questions um, from the questions that were submitted to me, did anybody have any questions in the chat? Based on my view, I can't see. I do see some questions in the chat. I can just okay. read them to you. Okay. So there are four specifically. One of them is, mm -hmm. uh, what do you think about the Stash Investment app? Um. I, I'm not pro or con stash. I think it's a reputable app and it's right in alignment with Acorn, Betterment, and I think it's a viable option. I want you to pick whichever one that you're actually going to use and that you feel comfortable with. Okay. The next question is, what does it mean to invest crypto? Can you cash out once you buy in? You can, you can cash out. And so cryptocurrency, that's the interesting thing about it. Although it's actually a form of currency, the value of it does go up and down. So if you put in $1,000 today, by tomorrow, it could be $1,500. The day after that, it could be $750. The value absolutely changes. But yes, if you put your money in, um, can you pull your money out? You can, but you want to make sure that you're investing in cryptocurrency with a reputable company. Now, what's really good about some of those other apps that I showed you, let me go back. Let me see if I can find it. Um, the Acorn, Betterment, Robinhood, you can actually invest in cryptocurrency through these apps now too. I think that's a great way to start. It's a great way to get your feet wet because at least you know you're dealing with a reputable company versus something, something random that gets sent to you in your email, something random that you're Googling. Please use one of these reputable companies. And again, you want to start small and get your feet wet. So basically you use your um, American dollar currency to invest mm -hmm. in cryptocurrency. So for example, one Bitcoin right now, I think, is worth over forty nine thousand dollars. So mm -hmm. that's kind of the is that how you translate yeah. that? That's how you translate it. So what you're saying is instead of saying you would say, oh, I have three hundred dollars to invest in Bitcoin. And then you would get whatever percentage that would be. So it's not like you cannot invest until you have the whole $49,000. Mm -hmm. You can go ahead and get a percentage of it. Your pro rata share based on the amount of money that you can actually invest. Okay. All right, next question. And I think you may have just answered this. What is the best way to learn how to invest using Bitcoin or crypto? Um, again, please start with one of these apps. I would start with one of these apps to, again, baby step in it because you want to learn the terminology. When they say blockchain, what does that mean? You know, when they start talking about, because Bit, Bitcoin is just one form of cryptocurrency, when they start naming all the other ones, there are dozens of them. When you hear that name, you want to be like, oh man, I'm familiar with that. You, you don't want to blindly, because otherwise, if you're blindly doing it, it literally is. It's like going to Vegas. You know, you might as well just go ahead and put your money down 
on the table, spin the wheel and just hope for something to happen. You want to educate yourself to make sure you are really confident and that you're really comfortable. Okay. I have a few more from the chat and then attendees may want to come off mute and ask themselves, but what is best term life insurance or whole life insurance? Um, I actually own both personally. And the reason why I own both is number one, because term is super cheap. I believe in getting it for the longest term possible. Um, I've never seen it more than a 30 year term. So that means if I buy it today, you know, I'm 52. That means in 30 years at 82, I'll be paying the same price for that period of time. And at the end of that, it just, it's like renting an apartment. It didn't go up in value. I can't cash out. I can't do anything. So it's really, it's just to make sure that there's a death benefit. It's for other people. If you get that whole life insurance, it just means, guess what? There's going to be a death benefit for the people you care about, but also the policy is going to increase in value, but it costs more. So that's why I'm saying do what you can afford because, and know what your goal is. Because if it's about a death benefit, is it just better for your budget for you to do something cheaper? Um, this is my... This is my personal opinion. I don't like, to me, insurance is for insurance and investing is for investing. You know, a lot of people wrap them together, um, but I'm like, I, insurance to me has a job. I wanna make sure that the insurance can do the job. And then when I wanna invest, then I focus on it. Um, but you can mix them together, but you wanna make sure, again, what are your goals? What are the fees? What are you getting involved in? Um, can you explain it? Could you explain it to someone else in a way that they can understand what you did, why you did it, and make sure you understand the products that you're investing in? Thank you. Thank you so much for answering that. Um, our next question in the chat is regarding long-term care. Okay. Um, paying for long-term care is always a big decision. Mm-hmm. I wonder with it, if you pay for it long-term and never need to use it, what happens to all the money you pay into it? Now, you know, it's interesting. Long-term care is really evolving. Um, I had a great aunt who back in the mid-2000s, I moved her from Los Angeles to Atlanta at 95, right? So I'm thinking she was a hairdresser. All she had was social security. And not that I had picked her date that she was gonna pass away, but she was very, very frail. I'm thinking at best when I moved her, she would live two years. Um, She lived seven years. Um, Not a dime put aside. Not a single dime. So guess who had the responsibility of taking care of her assisted living needs? I did. So I know the pain of when people are not prepared. So the question becomes, how much is it going to cost? There are life insurance policies that have long-term care bundled in them. It's an additional rider. Um, Can it just be for you? Could it be for you and maybe your spouse? You want to make sure you're clear on all of the rules. But um, I know what I was paying for assisted living care, and I'm not talking about nursing home care um, in Atlanta. So it's not like it's, you know, Chicago or New York. I don't even want to know what it's going to cost when I get that age. But what can I afford to do now? You know, the math has to be right. And you want, again, what's going to happen to that money? Um, Is any of that accumulating? Get all your questions answered because there's so many different policies with so many different features. And you want to make sure the company that you're talking to is um, AM Best, capital A, capital M, best rated. So that lets you know if an insurance company, how financially stable they are. Because you want to make sure that you're talking, whether it's life insurance, um, disability insurance, long-term care insurance, you want to know what their A and best rating is. So you should be A, A plus and above. I'm not even going to do business with a company that's a B because that speaks to how financially stable they are because guess what? You're spending all this money 
if you need the money 10 years from now, you want to know that that company is in a strong financial position to be able to pay. So clearly check out the ratings, but ask all of your questions. There's so many different policies. You want to make sure you're clear on the features. That's a great question for those of us as we mature. We've got a few more. Okay. Uh, do you want to answer them now or do you want to? Give me one more. Okay. So the next one is, uh, you talked about that magic number. How do you decide on that magic number where you can live comfortably after retirement? Okay. So what I strongly suggest that you do is please use one of the re many retirement calculators that are out there. Bank rate has a really good one. Uh, Nerd Wallet has them, but there are tons of really good retirement calculators. So they're gonna ask you a series of questions. How much money do you make? How much money do you have saved? Um, what are your monthly expenses gonna be? And then they can kind of put together a, a picture for you to say, oh my gosh, Antoinette, you are right on task here. Okay, you are... $200,000 short, $300,000 short, whatever the case may be. And then you can even play with the numbers because if you say, you know what, when I retire, I'm going to need $75,000 a year in income. If I take that down to $50,000, what would that look like? So it will allow you to play with all these different scenarios without having to do any math because who can or wants to do all that math? So in the context of retirement is a couple of suggestions that I have for all of you. Um, this is one thing that a lot of people don't think about. Find at least two retirement mentors. These are people who have already retired, and, but people who are gonna be honest with you. So they can tell you what they did right, what they did wrong, um, how they prepared, so that way you can um, learn from people who are ahead of you. Because it's um, not you, but you think people retire have been, and have be, been retiring okay. for years. Um, the other thing that you want to be able to do is... Um, huh? Pamela. Pamela, you need to mute yourself. Thank you. Um, retirement mentors is huge. Um, one thing that I've noticed with people who have retired well, they retired and their house was paid off. You want to have as little debt as humanly possible. So that's another thing for you to be focused on right now. What would it take for me to be as close to debt free or debt free? You know, when do I need to buy another car? How much do I have left on my house? Should I be downsizing? You know, what are all of those, those decisions? Because you want to be really, really proactive about that. But I, I can tell you the retirement mentors has helped me so much personally. Just really talking to people because I know exactly what people feel that they did right or wrong. And for those of you who are close, um, and I know a lot of times as sores, I know a lot of us are in education. And you're like, oh, I'm only in my 40s. You need to meet with them people now. So you have an idea of how much money you're going to get, what your benefits are going to be. Don't wait. You don't have to wait until you're in your 50s or your 60s to have an idea of what these numbers look like. The earlier you start, the better off you're going to be. So please don't put it off. Please, please, please don't put it off. All right, because I think retirement is one. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Antoinette. You set me up perfectly because the next question that got submitted to me was how do you grow retirement savings? Um, and then what are we talking about? Knowing your number, using one of those retirement calculators. Um, you have to treat your retirement like a bill. See, because a lot of times what we're doing is we are living our life and then we save money, whether it's retirement or emergency savings or the money that we're investing. We want to allocate that money after we've paid our bills, but it actually should go the opposite way. That money should come out first. And then we have the money to pay our bills. We're doing our, does that make sense to y'all when I say that? So we're thinking about our life and our lifestyle versus saying, no, no, no. 
I have to contribute X to my retirement. This is my take home pay. I contribute X to my retirement. Then I get to pay these bills here. And that flips everything. Because again, we, we've been trained and we've been doing it. Most of us have been doing it the wrong way. Um, you can't save that money after you pay the bills. You save the money first, then you pay the bills. And that's going to change your spending. Like it's going to give you a completely different perspective when you handle it that way. The other thing too, ladies, that I see a lot of us do, we don't even look at our retirement statements. Y'all not logging on. Once a month, you know you need to be logging in. That should be in your calendar. You have to get used to looking at your statements, retirement statements, investment statements, you know, you, how you lose sight of where you are. So you don't do it once a quarter. You don't do it every six months. You need to be doing that every single month. It's going to give you different perspective. But the other thing, too, it's going to keep that retirement goal right up in your face, too. It's going to help drive your decisions and what you're doing. Okay. This was a really good question and I'm appreciated whoever submitted this. They said, are there investments other than retirement? Can return on investments be taken before retirement to purchase a home, car, boat, or other? So retirement ladies is just really a type of account. You have like a retirement account, maybe like your 401k through your job. Uh, maybe you, you all have heard of like IRAs, individual retirement accounts, you know, Roth IRA, traditional IRA. If anybody's self-employed, maybe you have like a SEP. Um, those are retirement accounts. And then you have just a regular investment account. And so I typically like to advise people to put money in retirement first because of the tax benefits. Because if you put money in your 401k through your job, um, you are actually gonna pay less in payroll taxes, okay? If you're self-employed like I am, um, all the contributions that I make to my company retirement plan, I get to write that off on my business tax return. Therefore, I'm paying less in taxes. So I'm super pro-retirement. Um, but I believe in the end, you fund your retirement. Now there's going to be restrictions on that money. You can't pull it out for whatever you want, whenever you want. You're going to have to get to that certain age um, before you technically can pull on that money without having any sort of penalty. <clears throat> but if you just have like a normal traditional brokerage account, an investment account, you go to Charles Schwab, you go to Morgan Stanley, you use Robin Hood. If you have just a traditional investment account, you can pull that money out whenever you choose. You can use it for whatever you want. Now you're gonna pay taxes on that, of course. You're gonna pay taxes on the growth, but you can use that money for whatever you want. So again, it's just in different buckets. You have that retirement buckets of money, there's going to be some rules and restrictions, but you get to pay less in taxes. Then you have that investment account. So, and, and you can do both. It's not either. I strongly suggest that you do both. All right. Um, okay. Someone says, if I'm living paycheck to paycheck, no extra for savings or investing, where do I start? I think, what's the statistic that, um, I think it's about 70% of Americans have less than $1,000 saved. Um, so that's regardless, that, that's regardless of income level. So we're not just talking about people who are unemployed, underemployed, on welfare. We're talking about working people. Over 70% of Americans have less than $1,000 saved. So this is my strategy on savings. Um, I believe... Um, some of us need separation from our money. And so maybe you have your main bank that you bank at. So my main bank that I bank at, I bank at Bank of America. Now the money that I'm saving, that's at a different bank. And actually it's a small black bank, City National Bank. I'm sorry, Citizens Trust Bank, Citizens Trust Bank. And right when it comes, although I own my own company, I'm on payroll, that money comes out of my check and goes directly over to 
this smaller bank. They're not everywhere. I do not have a debit card um, because that's money that's meant to save. So that means if I want the money, I have to get up. I have to get in my car. I have to drive up. Who wants to be bothered doing all that? So I believe in separation. Some of us need it. Know thyself. Tell the truth. You know, there's no shame in that. You can have your checking in one, but you know how easy it is to transfer back and forth. Oh, 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 you know, I needed to do X. You just transfer them back and forth. Meanwhile, you look up a month later, savings is gone, halfway gone, because you made it too easy. So you need to create that separation. So separation and automation are your friends. So even if you can only start with $5, $10 a paycheck. You have it come directly out of your paycheck and it needs to go to that bank. You cannot rely upon yourself to do that because life is going to start happening and then you're going to start making excuses. So that way, have it come directly. And for those of you who are self-employed, because again, I am too, I, um, I do the same thing for my business. So I have an operating account for my business but I also have a separate business savings account where every month I'm taking a certain percentage of our revenue and I'm moving that over. Just automatic, okay? So and for any of my entrepreneurs out there, um, a book that I love, 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 love and highly recommend is called Profit First. Mike McCallowitz, Profit First. When I read that book, I promise you I'm a CPA, I have a master's degree in taxation. It completely changed how I operate my business from an accounting perspective. So it's a little longer than it needs to be. It's not technical. He just got a little wordy, but it just teaches you when the money comes in, how you begin to separate it in different accounts. So again, for any entrepreneurs or aspiring entrepreneurs, that book is definitely worth that investment. But again, Separation and automation, start small. Um, my other savings tip is this. So say you are starting with 10, 20 bucks every pay period. You need a reminder in your calendar, maybe 45 days, 60 days, when you're going to remind yourself to increase that. Because again, we're just going to get on autopilot living. You need a prompt to know when it's time to increase that because we want to keep raising those numbers up. Same thing with your 401k. Maybe you're doing 4%. Now it's time to go to four and a half, you know, then it's time to go to five. When are you going to reevaluate that? you got to have that reminder in your calendar. All right, another great question. Someone's asking me about, will my heirs have to pay taxes on a lump sum inheritance? So your estate has to be $11.7 million to pay estate taxes. Okay. Cool thing about life insurance that's why we got to pay attention to what all the mother folks are doing. Life insurance is not taxable. Someone leaves you a million dollars, guess what? You get a million dollars. So it is an amazing strategy on how to move up to the next level. So again, unless your estate is over $11.7 million, you don't have to worry about that. Okay, so here are just a couple of quick money tips that I wanted to share with y'all. And then Antoinette, we can answer some more questions. Um, so all of these things require action from us, ladies. All of these things, it's only three, but they all require action. Number one is schedule. You at a minimum should be having a money meeting every other week, two times a month. And you're like, Janine, what's a money meeting? This is when you sit down, you are looking at your balances, you're checking out your statements, um, maybe you're paying bills, but that's not the focus. Um, you're checking in with your money goals, you're looking at your investment accounts, maybe you're doing some research. Now, when, you're, when it's money meeting time, there's no Netflix, there's no social media, there's no kids. Um, what are all the other things? You're not cooking, you're not on the phone with your girlfriends. Like you are focused. You're not doing anything else but focused on your money. For those of us who are married, in a perfect world, you would be doing this with your spouse. And you're like, oh, Janiya, that is so stressful. 
Some of us will have to have those meetings in public um, because a lot of us cannot have a reasonable conversation without it being emotional. At least if you're in public, people will use their inside voices. But you have to get that practice because guess what? Y'all are working so hard making this money, but you're not, you don't have a plan or a strategy. You got to sit down at least twice a month and focus. Okay. So please, please do that beginning in October. So I don't know if it's the weekends. I don't know if it's the evenings. No kids, no phone, no Netflix, no TV, no nothing. I want you focused on money. Have a beginning, ending time. Have your agenda set. Okay. Of course, you need to join our Thank Me Later community. Completely free. Um, all of the resources, videos, I mean, we have, like we talked about estate planning. Tiffany McKenzie did a free session with us on preparing our power of attorneys and healthcare power of attorneys. Um, we, um, again, we're focused on insurance. Everything from getting organized, um, any financial topic, we have the content for you. Videos, downloads, all of that's free. All you have to do is go to thankmelater.money and we will connect you to our free community. Okay, so please do that. And this last one surprises a lot of people. Build your money team. People are always like, Janai, I don't have a lot of money. You have a team, but you're not treating them like a team. You already have one. You already have an insurance agent, I know that. You know, Car insurance, homeowners insurance, renters insurance, whatever you got going on. Your insurance is not just a bill. You should have a relationship or rapport with your agent. That's important. They're part of your team. Have a car accident, have a fire or a theft at your house. You want somebody who's going to be like, Valerie, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry you have this going on. You want somebody who knows you and who cares about you. So your insurance agent is part of your team. If you have an accountant, you have a CPA, you have a tax preparer, okay? They are part of your team. Don't just think about it like you're getting your tax return done, all right? Um, maybe you use an investment advisor. They are also part of your team. Um, maybe you have a relationship with someone at your bank, whether it's the person who handles your mortgage, your business or personal accounts, you have to think about it like a money team. Who is missing on your team? Who do you not have a relationship with? Who do you need to get rid of? And you have to be intentionally talking to these people. This, again, this is all part of your money meetings. Um, when are you talking to your accountant? When you, once a year or once or twice a year, you should be talking to your insurance agent. You have to be intentional about your money team. I don't care if you make $50,000 a year. I don't care if you make $500,000 a year. Think about them as a money team. And it's going to change how you move and the decisions that you make. Okay? So schedule, join, build. That's your homework. That is certainly your homework. Antoinette, you had a couple more questions for me? Yes, thank you for that homework. Those are great <laughs> takeaways. Yikes. All right, let's um let's do a few questions. Okay. Um we have so many questions. The atten everyone is very engaged. Okay. Yay. Um, good, 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 good. I'm glad this is helpful. So the next question in here says. Roth IRA or traditional? I've heard that if you plan to live off your retirement fund, you'll likely be in a lower tax bracket than when you're employed and a Roth will cost you more. What are your thoughts? Okay. So can anybody tell me the difference between a Roth and a traditional? Anybody know? Um, I think I might. Tell me, tell me. Um, I believe the Roth IRA is... Uh, your like they take the money out for the account pre-tax and then traditional is post-tax dollars right right so so what will happen is with your Roth IRA with your Roth IRA you make the contribution today 
You don't get any deduction for it. You pull the money out later, you don't pay the taxes. Traditional IRA, you contribute the money now, you get the deduction for it, but you're gonna pay taxes on that money later when you pull that money out. So Roth obviously is the new, is the new and improved one. It's the new and improved. I have a Roth IRA. Um, I'm doing everything I can to throw as much money as I can at retirement because I am committed to living the life that I want to live. Period. So I want you to do, um, again, do your research based on your, most people tend to go with the Roth. But um, there might be a situation for you where the traditional is better for you, but um, that's a great place to start. That's a great place to begin. All right. Thank you. The next question. Um, my daughter just started her own business doing lashes and it is going well. She is young and the money is coming quickly and going quickly. <laughs> what site would be user friendly for a younger person? Okay, so what I suggest for all entrepreneurs, I don't care if you're making $1,000 a year or if you're making $3 million a year, from an accounting software, because accounting is, they call the language of business, because that's, accounting lets you know what's coming in and then what's going out. You want to use QuickBooks. It is inexpensive. You want to use QuickBooks Online, QBO, QuickBooks Online. It is inexpensive and it's designed for people who are not accountants. So it's a great way because your daughter needs to understand, you know, what's coming in, what are her expenses, so she can figure out how profitable she really is. Because a lot of times we're running our business based on the balance that's in our bank account. You cannot run a business based on the balance in your bank account. Okay, so um, again, QuickBooks, um, they're owned by Intuit. So they own TurboTax, they own Mint, they own Credit Karma. So it is one huge conglomerate. I would do commercials for them people for free. I love their software and I think it's super, super easy to use. Yeah, that's been a game changer for me. Um, when you recommended the Intuit products and Mint, the app, I was unsure because you have to enter all your bank account and link all your accounts. But once I felt comfortable, you helped me feel comfortable doing that. And they will send me a message in a minute like, uh, you are $13 over on your- <laughs> Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> on your groceries. <laughs> so it's been really good for like that day-to-day -day management. Yeah. So Antoinette, I'm glad you shared that. For those of you who are like, oh, Janai, I cannot stay on a budget. Jesus, help me, Lord. <laughs> I'm too much of this, too much shopping, too much eating out, too much of whatever. Mint, you do have to link your accounts, but you set your budget. Maybe Valerie says, I can only spend $50 a month eating out. When Valerie's getting close, she'll get the notifications like, hey girl, slow down. Wait, 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 you're almost here. If you're over, it does the work for you. And you know, behaviorally, we a lot of us need the prompts and the reminders. It pats you on the back when you've done a good job, but it will slow you down when you are just a little bit out of control. So again, it's free too. So Mint is free. Of course, Credit Karma is free. You're going to have to pay for TurboTax and you're going to have to pay for the QuickBooks as well. But it's cheap though. So, so worth it. All right. Our next couple of questions are about cryptocurrency. So mm, it's funny how one popular question that is. Yes. One question says, I am looking at Bitcoin right now. Is it normal that it will constantly change every second? All the time. It's going to constantly change. It's going to log in now, log in in an hour, you log in 30 minutes, you log in tomorrow. The value is going to be constantly changing. Yes, that is normal. Okay. Um. How do you feel about Dogecoin? Dogecoin? Dogecoin, doggy coin. Dogecoin. <laughs> Dogecoin. Dogecoin. Doge. It went from like, um, I think it started at like three cents and then it went up to about 53 cents a share, maybe uh, 
in July or June. Okay. okay. Um, I never make any investment recommendations to people. And, and I can tell you all this. Um, well, number one, I'm not an investment advisor. I'm a CPA by trade. And the other thing too is this, a lot of times we're not just making investment decision based on facts. We're also making it based on the lens of who we are. Um, I am ultra conservative. Now that's what serves me. That might not be best for what Antoinette or for Valerie or Elaine or anybody else. You have to decide what your investment personality is. So maybe you can handle a lot of risk. Maybe you're ultra conservative. You know, maybe you're somewhere in the middle. Like you have to do whatever you need to do so you can sleep really good at night. So when the market is going up and down, Bitcoin is going up and down, you don't want to be nauseous. You know, you, you don't want to be sick. You don't want to be worried. So what is going to give you peace? So to me, that's really, really important. So again, I'm all for making money. But again, I can only look at it through the lens of my personal experience. And I think for me as an entrepreneur, I'm like, I have busted my behind. Um, and plus I'm over 50. Like I don't, I'm not 30 anymore where I feel like I have that time. So I have become a lot more conservative now, but that's what serves me. So I'm not anyway suggesting that, oh yeah, this is the right way for everybody. That's what that's what's right for me. So know your own investment personality. And if you're working with an investment advisor, make sure they're aware of your investment personality too, your goals and your personality. Because that's gonna help just gonna help you all make really good decisions together. All right. We do have some more how much time do you have? <laughs> Girl, just ask me, girl. Come on, come on. Yeah. What you got? Okay, let's see. I have always been told that ensuring your child guarantees insurability for the child. It is usually mm -hmm. a whole life policy and it will accumulate cash value. What are your thoughts on this? Um, I have two opinions on that. There, there, are, two, there are two mindsets about insuring children. Um, one is what she shared about getting a whole life policy that that way, regardless of health, that this policy can stay in place. So that is one mindset. And then there's another mindset that people only insure people who earn money. If you don't bring money into the household, I'm not going to insure you. So what's the right answer? What, what brings you peace? So I think it's important that we are able to, um, first of all, know the goal. Are you trying to make sure that this child always has an insurance policy in place? Is that the goal? Are you trying to have a death benefit if something, God forbid, happens that you're able to cover the expenses? So based on the goal, like I never insured my kids because I, now I made sure I had plenty of insurance on my husband. Because I'm like, if something happens to him, I need to be able to replace that income. And I want to live at my current standard or better if something happens to him. So that's what happens to a lot of us. Um, our mate dies and then we're struggling. That's not going to be me. So can I um, maybe speak for the group or just speak as another voice here? Mm -hmm. With that, we are in a crowd um funding crowdsourcing gofundme oh my God. culture right. and so how do we reconcile that mindset of well if you don't bring money in the home i'm not going to insure you but if something happens to you even if you don't bring money in the home i want to be able to put you away respectfully right. you know respectably without having to get on facebook and and no disrespect to anyone that has had to do that, but there are options, you know. Right. And, and you're right. We are in a um, um, GoFundMe culture right now. And so, again, that's why you have to know your personal situation. Do you have enough money set aside if something happened to your kids or someone else where you're going to be in charge? 
Do you have enough money set aside for that? Yes, no. Yes, then potentially you can make one decision. If you're like, no, okay, then yes, you definitely need to look at getting an insurance policy. Um, and again, it doesn't have to be 500,000 or $100,000. You can get a $50,000 policy. What can you afford so you can respectfully put people away? So again, that's why, what's your goal? You got to know what your goal is and what you want to accomplish. What can your budget afford? Um, so again, I'm not anti-insuring kids, but it's about what, what, what ultimately are you trying to make sure that happens here? Just watch your budget. Watch your budget, though, because again, um, I want to make sure that, that you can the afford the policy. Okay. okay. I'm sorry. Did someone just have a question? Okay. We'll do a couple more from the chat, and then okay. um, we do have a final, um, just little door prize that we want to do. And then for those that are able to stay on, we can stay on and finish the Q and A if that's okay. Okay, no problem. Okay, the next question, what firms would you suggest for self-employed retirement investing? So I'm assuming you they mean investment firms? I'm assuming that's what they mean. Like a um, mortgage. Let's see, uh, Demia, if you are able to come off mute, if you can clarify your question about self-employed retirement investing. Yes, you were correct. Okay. So, uh, you know, I'm all about relationship. To me, it's, it's driven by the person, not necessarily the firm. Um, and that's how I've always made my decisions. You know, honestly, what I did in 2020 I completely, when I talked about the money team, I completely switched out my whole money team with the, with the exception of my insurance person because I've been with the same people forever. And I'm like, you know what? I need fresh perspective. Um, I want to make sure that I'm not arrogant, that I think, you know, I know everything. Like I want, I want to make sure that I'm getting guidance. So I ended up looking for people that I felt that I had really good rapport with and I'm, we're already assuming, of course, they've got the credentials, they have the experience, but I need chemistry. Like, I need to want to talk to you. I need to feel understood and heard. So that's what I'm looking for first. And then, now I can tell you this, this is one of my own personal paranoias. I prefer working with people who are at major firms. Um, I don't know if it really helps or not, but it helps me. You know, there's just something about knowing all about all that compliance, all of the rules. I don't really feel comfortable dealing with one off people. I like the comfort of a firm. So it doesn't mean it has to be like Morgan Stanley. Um, there's one firm that I work with. It's a regional firm. Um, it's not a national firm. Um, but I ended up working with them because I had a relationship with a couple of people who worked there for about three years before I started working with them. So to me, like I said, I need relationship because I think about it. Um, it's, to me, it's like the level of intimacy, like where you would send your kids to daycare or school. Like, it's, this is my money. Do you know how hard I have worked for this? I am going to make sure that we have good chemistry. And I'm not dealing with anybody who I don't enjoy talking to. I don't want anybody who's talking over me, who's all technical, talking all fast. See, I can't be bothered with any of that. I, I need to know that we, 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 are, we are here, you know? Um, and I also make sure that I'm talking to people typically, if not monthly, I'm talking to them every other month. That's important to me. If you don't have time to talk to me, I'm not saying I need you for hours, but checking in because I'm still learning. The market is constantly changing. You know, my, my life, you know, my life is changing. I want to make sure we have good rapport. You know what's going on with me. You know what's going on with my kids, my husband. Like this is where I am and making sure that we're working towards my goals. So I hope that helps. Um, Those are great. 
Yes, yeah, there's one tips. store that I do recommend. Um, her name is Stacy Crittenden. S T A C E E. Stacy Crittenden. I think Stacy is she with? I think she's with Merrill Lynch. She's out of the D.C. area. Um, Antoinette, I can email that to you. Um, okay. But a lot of times when I'm doing presentations about money, um, I don't know how Stacy and I ended up. We've done several together, but um, she, um, I like her a lot. I don't work with her personally, but I have presented with her several times. And it's not, I don't care. I love my sorority. I don't care anything about the fact that she is an AKA. It's just that I have been around her enough. So I'm like, okay, I like how she talks to people. I like where she meets people where they are. You want to know people's fees and you want to know what their minimums are. Because a lot of people have a minimum to open an account. You want to know what that is. And let's, let's get to the fees right away. Like, I'm not pretending about this. You may not be writing them a check, but I assure you that they are deducting fees from your account. Like, I want to talk about all that straight up. Okay, uh, we'll do this question and then we'll do a couple of uh, door prizes and we'll go back to Q&A. Okay. I noticed that our white friends often have family financial advisors pass that many generations of the family use. What is the best way to go about finding a trustworthy financial advisor? And I think you just gave us some tips. I just talked on, about that. On that, okay. And, and let me tell you something else that I do. Um, and I haven't always done it, just started doing it over the last couple of years. Now, my sons are 27 and 31. So when I'm talking about these money meetings, man, when I started adding my kids to these money meetings, oh my God, game changer. Um, so when we updated our wills and all that stuff last year, my kids participated in that whole process. They got their healthcare power of attorneys and power of attorneys done. You know, like we meet and we talk because we do not want to be taking care of them forever. We need to make sure that they get independent like this. And then for me, um, my um, I was adopted. My mother who adopted me adopted me as a single parent. Um, and so when my mom passed away, she was the only parent I ever had because my mother never got married. And that's why I know she probably had a fear and a paranoia of that because she always made sure that I was independent. And I think that's part of me too. I don't want something to happen to me and my children are walking around like zombies. They don't know how to manage their finances. They don't know what to do. You know, like, who do you call? Like, where's the life insurance? Um, now you have to make sure that your children are at a certain level of maturity. Um, but the earlier that we indoctrinate them, I'm telling you, it is a game changer because, you know, our, our kids are very out of touch, uh, particularly with all this technology. Who even goes to the bank anymore? You know, when we were younger, at least you went to the bank. Like kids have no, it's funny talking to little kids and, you know, you have a debit card or credit card. They just think there's an endless amount of money on those things. We have to exert different effort to make sure we're exposing our kids. But yeah, be comfortable. You know, when I was younger, my mom, when she paid bills, I, she always made me sit down with her. That's why I always knew how much everything cost. Like, oh, okay. She was an educator, single woman. She adopted two kids, you know? Like, now I understand why we can do this and why we can't do X it completely changes everything. So you are not protecting your children by keeping them at bay when it comes to money. Even what stuff costs. You know, whenever I buy something, an appliance, a car, whatever, I take my kids with me. Absolutely. Like, let's learn how to negotiate this. So really important lesson. Extremely important lessons. Thank you. Thank you. I love that you have on the slide how to stay in touch. Yes. Um, in the Thank Me Later community that you mentioned, um, ladies, please join that community. There's an app. I mean, it is just so easy. The emails come to you um, and you're really getting quality um, education for free. So please join that community. 
Um, you can follow Janai Thornton at um, Janai Thornton on Instagram and TML Money. And then she gave you her personal uh, email address where you can reach out to her. So we are going to just stick a pin right here. Um, we just wanted to find a, um, a small way to say thank you to uh, those of you who have who have joined in with us tonight. So we do have a few door prizes. Um, and I don't know if, Savanya, if you want to talk about the prizes that we have while I pull up our prize wheel. So hopefully I have everyone. Um, thank you, everyone, for sharing this. We had, I want to say, the highest number I saw was 98 wow, attendees. that's great. One tonight. So that's what? very exciting. Um, we started out with wanting this to be an intimate conversation. I think we said, let's talk, get 25 women together and talk about money. Right. And so um, so thankful for, for how this was shared. So let's go to our prize wheel. Savannah, if you want to tell everybody what we have. So tonight, um, we just want everyone to focus on a target. Just pick a target. It doesn't matter how large or small, just set it. And to encourage you to do that, we have um, three Target gift cards to give away tonight, uh, $25. So, all right, Sora, Antoinette, you can start this bit. Um, okay, start this we'll do it three times. And you must be present to win. So <laughs> uh, when your name comes up, just come off mute and let us, uh, let us know how excited you are. Tonia. Tonia, are you still on? Oh, Tonia, are you still on? I don't think she's still on. So we will do this again. Okay. Hold on, guys. Let me just remove her from there. All right, let's do this again. Robin, congratulations. Are you still on? Yay. Yes, I'm Yay, still okay. on. <laughs> Robin. Awesome. Yay, congratulations. You. If you want to just direct message me um, your contact information, we will make sure we get your uh, gift card to you to help you stay on target and remind you to stay on target. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Joyce, I know I heard you on and I saw you in the chat. Are you still on? Yes, I'm still here. Thank you so much. <laughs> Joyce, looking cute. Yeah, and you this know. has you been super such cute. a great presentation. I, I <laughs> am so happy that I joined. So glad Thank that you, you came. Thank you, Sora Janine. <laughs> All right. Um, if you want to just send me your direct message, me your contact information, we will get your gift card to you to remind you to stay on target. I will, Sora, right now. Thank you. And this Thank is you. our last one. Crystal S. Are you still on? Is that Crystal Smith? Yes. Okay. Yes, I am. Yay. I'm so happy. Yay, <laughs> Congratulations. Well, thank you. Congratulations. Thank you for, uh, thank you for joining us this evening. We really yes, appreciate each and every one of you um, for joining in. And we do have some more questions. So if we know it's been an hour and a half, if you do have to drop off, uh, we definitely understand. However, um, if you have time to stay on, if our speaker is willing to stay on for yep, stay a on. few more minutes, thank you. I will um, pull up a few more questions here. So our next question was, 
I'm a single woman, early 30s, no kids, and in the middle of my debt snowball. Should I be actively investing while paying my consumer debts? Oh, good question. So can anybody tell me what the debt snowball is? Anybody explain the snowball? Sure. Is it when you, like you take, you look at all your bills and then you target the bills with the lowest balances. And then once you pay off the lowest balance, you use the money that you um, were using to pay the lowest balance and then you apply it to the next lowest balance and so on and so forth. Yep, that's exactly what it is. So it's a great strategy to get out of debt. So you just list all your bills. Um, and some people do the snowball, you're paying them off by smallest balance, and then you progressively go on. And some people do um, the other method, the avalanche method, where you're paying off the one with the highest interest rate first. I think you should do whichever one you prefer. People like the snowball because you can see more progress faster. You know, you get the momentum going faster. Um, so then the question becomes, when you're focused on that, should you be investing too? Um, I want to make sure before you focus on any debt that you have saved a minimum. You have to have saved a minimum of $1,000. And the reason why, and some people say even double that because you don't want life to happen. A medical bill, you need a new tire, car breaks down, and then, you know, life has happened. Now your budget is just a hot mess. You want to have some money set aside first. So pick the number that's best for you and your lifestyle. But again, the experts say at least a thousand, a little bit more than that might give you a little bit more cushion. Then you go ahead on and you put everything towards that snowball. Now, um, what I always suggest to people, because we're always so focused on debt, that a lot of times I just don't think we focus on having another source of income. Because you could have a source of income that you use 100% just to pay off debt, or just to save, or just to invest. So um, that's also a strategy too, to help you get out of debt faster. So you have one source of income, maybe your job, you use that to pay your bills. Then you have this other source that you throw 100% of it towards whatever your goal is. Thank you. Thank you for that tip. I really, um, I appreciate that. So I'm sure um, this contributor does as well. Um, our next question is for the Roth IRA. Isn't there a limit you can contribute each year? I was advised this for my own Roth. Um, there is, is it 7,000? I'm trying to remember the number. And the only reason yes, why it, is based it's on your- 7,000. It's 7,000. But I think once you're over 50, that that number is different. Contribution limit. Um, first of all, the contribution limit changes annually. So it tends to get bumped up. So it is um, 7,000 if you're over age 50, it's 6,000 if you're under. Mm -hmm. But again, that number can change annually though. And what do you contribute as much as you can? technician you are you're sustaining pure gorgeous with my bottom notes where okay i'll go ahead and mute that uh thank you let me just see i i want to say that was our last question i definitely oh. want to um if there's anyone still on the form if you want to ask a question you are more than welcome to come off mute and do so but this was such an oh wait a minute I did just find one my 22 year old daughter just started her dream job what is your number one money recommendation before she gets her first paycheck oh my gosh these kids with this money <laughs> lord these kids with this money um you know one thing that I really want to encourage us as parents to do like we got to start backing off with them financially right away we want them to learn to survive on their own. Um, there's so many of us who our kids are working. We're still paying the cell phone bill. We're still helping with the car insurance. No, ma'am, you need that money for you. Imagine how much money you would have if you used it all for you. And I'm not talking about cutting off your 10-year-olds. 
I'm talking about your grown kids, not your babies. When they're over 20, they're not your babies anymore. There are kids, you know, but they're not our babies anymore. So we're not going to cut off our minor kids. But I need you to start backing off of those adult children for sure. And so what's really important is our kids have to learn to live below their means. Because a lot of them have really gotten accustomed to a really amazing lifestyle, which is ours. It's not theirs. So they need to live to learn below it. Um, they need to be saving money out the door. And they have to remember that whatever the apartment that they live in, the car that they're driving, this is not the car that they're going to have forever. This is not the apartment that they're going to have forever, but this is where they're starting. Because I think a lot of times they want to come out and they want to be at our level, but they haven't earned the right to be at our level yet. They haven't put in the work yet. So I want to make sure that they're okay, that it's a progression to get there. And then I know I wish I was, certainly would have done it when I graduated and started working. I wish I would have started contributing to my retirement plan as soon as I started work. And I didn't. Yes, at 20. Can you imagine if we all would have done that? Like with your first job, like some of y'all wouldn't be working right now had y'all done that. Like for real. So, but she can learn to live on what's left over right from the beginning. That would be huge. That would be a game changer for her. Mm -hmm. And some of these 10 year olds need to be cut off too, because they uh, are, <laughs> they want we, the we're going to cut the 10 year olds off too. Answer that. And we're cut the 10 years old. Oh my God. I don't want anybody getting in trouble with child protective out here. Oh my goodness. Um, <laughs> But thank you. I definitely, definitely. That was agree. a really, really good question, though. That's really good. We got to give these kids moms. I know I frustrate moms all the time. If you're choosing between funding your retirement or funding your kids' college education, you pick your retirement first. Can I ask a clarifying question? Just sure. So, for our adult children, you know, what if they're in college? Are there concessions for, you know, can you do that within those four years that they're in college? I'm not saying, you know, pay for their tuition or get the parent plus loan, but like, what about, you know, continuing to pay their cell phone bills, continuing to do their car insurance, things like that, that um, it wasn't done for me, but, you know, we, we are doing that for our kids now because we can. So what's your suggestion right. on that? I think it has to be a healthy balance because I think because so many of us are first generation doing better, that we have removed from our children the opportunity to learn a lot of things that we learned. Our resourcefulness, um, because we're doing so much for them because we can afford to do it. So I'm not saying cut them off and they need to be working full time and going to school full time. But when they have responsibility, they treat money differently. You know, working over the summer, you know, when I was in college, you know, I had to work over the summer. I had a car. I had to work, have enough money to pay my car note up for six months. My mom was like, girl, can't help you, boo. So, but that taught me to be very resourceful. So I think it's important that our kids are really maximizing their time over the summer, that they have some responsibility. Um, and you know, again, when I just made that comment, if you're choosing between taking care of your retirement or something for your kids' education, you have to pick your retirement because you don't have any financial aid for your retirement. There's no Pell Grant, you know, there, there, there's no scholarship. Like, it's all on you. These kids have so many ways to pay for education, but a lot of times they don't have to because we're filling in the gap. Versus saying, you know, I told my kids, your degree is not going to say Cameron and Janai Thornton. It, it, it just doesn't say that. Like, well, you got to figure this out. And so we don't need to deprive our children the opportunity to build that muscle. So you know when you've gone too far, you know, but it's important for them to understand what stuff costs. And then also you want to make sure you're giving them the warnings of, okay, you, this is how you're going to be cut off. This, this is what this progression looks like. So when my youngest son graduated from college, I was like, okay, I'm going to give you, he was moving to LA, thinking he was grown, he was cute. I'm like, listen, nobody kidnapped you and took you to LA, right? 
This is your choice. You wanted to go. So I'm like, uh, you can live on the moon if you want to. I'm not paying for you to live out there. The choice is yours. But I will pay your car insurance for six months. After that, you're on your own. So sometimes it's nice that we give them a little warning, senior year, okay, boo, like this, this is, at this state, you're coming off of this. At this state, you're coming off of this because they need to start thinking. Like, ooh, let me get ready. Ooh, like mom is for real. <laughs> So speaking of those college age children, the right. next question just came in. Do you recommend contributing to a 529 plan for college? Um, I'm very pro 529 provided you have taken care of your, you are maxing out your retirement first. You got to throw everything at this retirement. Um, I did have it for my kids, but you know what? I never told them that they had it. Because I, I, didn't I didn't want my kids getting comfortable. Like, okay, boo, like, what, what you doing here? So um, I ended up, my oldest son got an academic scholarship that he ended up losing because he was having too much fun in school. Um, so he went to a and where I went undergrad, sat out a semester, got it together, went back to school and finished. My youngest son got an athletic scholarship. He still has 529 money left over now because he didn't even need it. But I didn't even tell them because I did not know, know your kids. I'm like, I did not want my kids leaning back like, oh, we're good. Mom has got this. No, 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 no. We can use this money for something else. There's so many ways to pay for education. Education to me is a business decision. You know, these kids are way, 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 way too much debt. And we are making emotional decisions about where they go versus business decisions about where they're going to go. We need them to be self-sufficient. Like, so I don't believe in you have to put your kids out at 18 and, you know, cutting them off, but we have to make sure that we are good first. Yes. You just brought up a, a good point and I'll, I'll wrap it up, but you said he still has 529 mm -hmm. funds because he did not use it. So there's no oh. money wasted. Um, Someone in my family, I asked, were they going to start a 529 for their child? And they're like, well, he's smart. He's not going to need that. <laughs> that was literally you know, that's response. true. Uh, but I can tell you what, that is the only baby shower gift that I give people. Like at the beginning, that's the only baby shower. I will give them um, whatever state that they live in. I'll print out the information. I'll give them some cash. Like, here you go. So I'm not that aunt. I'm not that godmother. I don't do no toys. I don't do no clothes. I don't do any of that. But I promise you I will contribute to that, though. Christmas, birthdays, and all of that. We culturally have to get used to that. Because our kids have so much stuff. We all know how much stuff our kids have. But if you contribute to that 529 and they don't need it for whatever reason, they still have yeah. those and funds. You, you can transfer it to another child, you, another relative. You can use it yourself. And then worst case scenario is if you use the money, say you're just going to give them like a down payment on a house or something. You only pay taxes on the gain. That what you contributed. You know, you put in 10, it grew to, it grew to 15 you only pay taxes on the $5,000 of the growth. So that's not bad to me. But you can transfer to another kid. Again, you can use it yourself. Your spouse can use it. You can transfer it to another relative. Or worst case, pull the money out and just pay the taxes on it. But I do, I think it's a great idea. If it's a great way of getting our families collectively engaged with the process. Because mm -hmm. that's the programming I think we have to do culturally. Wow, this has been the best hour, 48 minutes. <laughs> I'm glad to talk to y'all, Antoinette. Thank you for stalking me on Instagram, girl. And now we're BFF. So now we are BFF. I will so just anytime. say this. At the time when I, when I started following you slash mm -hmm. stalking you, I did not mm -hmm. even know mm -hmm. that you were my sorority sister. Oh, you didn't? Right? Absolutely. Remember? Okay. That was oh, like, why is all your stuff pink and green? Right. <laughs> right. 
Right. But no, I'm anytime, anytime that I'm able to have help you a yeah. chapter, any way that I can engage with you all, it's, it's my pleasure to do that. That's the least I can do. It's my Thank you. And there's yeah. so many things coming, you know, in the chat. I for see you. them. You I guys see them. Are... Well, I appreciate it. And I love talking to Black women. And I certainly yes. love talking to Black women about money for sure. Absolutely. Well, thank you. We are going to wrap up for the okay. evening. Everybody's giving you some air claps and thanks, Valerie. And Good to see you. We thank you for having me. Been... I see you, Tracy Bell Thomas, too. Thank you all. <laughs> Your leadership. Thank you all so much. Yes, it's been a phenomenal evening. So um, thank you. And we will do this again. I promise. Okay. I've already okay, gotten direct sure. messages about when is the next green table talk? I know. <laughs> Yeah, anytime, ladies. So good to see all of you. All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a great night. All right. Good night.